Last week on Midday Sunday, we took you to the top of Mount Wilson where the gigantic earthbound telescopes look deeply into space. This week, we look from a different vantage point, the Kepler Space Observatory, orbiting in our solar system where it provides an unprecedented view of the universe and where it's discovered Kepler 452b, a planet that might be Earth's virtual twin. We're also going to look a lot closer to home at Pluto, where a few weeks ago the New Horizons spacecraft began sending us dazzling pictures of the outermost member of our solar system. Everybody who ever looks up at the night sky participates in something like this. Anybody who has any curiosity at all about the nature of nature, anybody who has ever longed to go beyond the next horizon, anybody who feels that burning passion for adventure or the excitement of exploration, I think everybody is enriched by something like what's happening today. Good Sunday morning, everybody. We hope to in, uh, include that enthusiasm and include that enthusiasm. Uh, I'm so dazzled I can't even talk. Uh, enthusiasm about all things stellar um, and all things out there in the universe today. Our guest this week is Dr. Charles Beichman. Um, you are the executive director of the Exoplanet, there's a long title. Science here. Institute. And that's a combination of JPL, Caltech, and NASA? That's correct. Why are we so excited about finding a planet out there that's kind of like ours? We're now at the 20th anniversary of finding the first planet outside our own solar system. 20 years ago, we knew of none. Now we're up to 1,883 confirmed exoplanets. Mm -hmm. So we're answering a 2,500-year-old question not with philosophy, not with guesswork, but with hard science. Let's define for our folks what exoplanet is. An exoplanet is basically a planet that could be a rocky thing like our own Earth. It could be an ice planet uh, like Uranus or Neptune or a large gas giant like Jupiter or Saturn, but not orbiting our own sun, but orbiting any other star in the galaxy. Mm -hmm. So 2,500 years we have been... We've been wondering, are, is there, are there planets other than the Earth? Right. And the ancients figured out that indeed we had seven, eight, nine, back to eight planets in our own solar system. Mm -hmm. And then we wondered, are there planets orbiting other stars? Mm -hmm. And we wondered, and we wondered, and we wondered. And around 1995, give or take a couple of years, people argue about it, we found the first exoplanet orbiting a nearby star. And when you say nearby, give us some sense of how far away it is, and I know that we're talking in terms of light years. So the very closest planet is about 15 light years away, and those were found by one particular technique where we watch the stars wobble in their path. Mm -hmm. The most distant ones we're finding now with the Kepler satellite are typically a few thousand light years away. Mm -hmm and we find planets in that range anywhere in between. Give us some sense, Doctor, uh, 15 light years. How many real years is that? Well, it, a light year is simply the time it takes light to go at the speed of light, 186,000 miles per second. You know, how long does it take a light beam leaving the sun today to get to that star, that planet? Mm -hmm. So light takes eight minutes to go from our sun to the Earth, it takes 15 light years to make it to the closest star with a planet that we know about. So we're, if we look at uh, Kepler 452b, right. when we see it today, that light left there how about long ago? About 1,400 years ago, uh -huh. which is very you know, short on the cosmic scale of things. Um, so it left you know, in the you know, early part of the uh, first millennium, and it made it here today, um, but that's essentially a blink of an eye in the lifetime of the star, the lifetime of the planet. But in re the, the, the fact still remains that when we see it today, we're actually not seeing it as it is today. Right. We're seeing it the way it looked 1400 years, years ago. Yeah. All right. But that's the still relatively close mm -hmm. on the scale mm -hmm. of the galaxy. Mm -hmm. The center of our galaxy is uh, sort of 24,000 light mm -hmm. years away. It's being described as a, a twin or a cousin to us, mm -hmm. and that's significant. Right, what you have with Kepler 452b and a few other of the over a thousand planets 
found and confirmed by Kepler, is what we call a Goldilocks planet. It's oh, not okay. too big, it's not too small, it's not too hot, too close to its star, it's not too cold, too far away. And in addition to being one of maybe a dozen of these Goldilocks planets, it's the only one that also orbits a star that's almost the twin of our own sun. Mm -hmm. We orbit what's called a G star, and that's what 452B orbits as well. It, it's an area called a habitable zone? The habitable zone, or which is sort of a sciencey way of saying the Goldilocks zone. Okay. We call it the habitable zone. If you're in too close to your star, the temperature of your planet you know, becomes very, very hot. Think of Venus. If you're too far away, it gets too cold, everything freezes out. Yeah, so and there, as we look at that graphic there, we can see, um, well, there's Earth, there's the Sun, there's Kepler and all that, but uh, the, the, there might be other planets? There could be other planets in that system. We haven't found them as of yet, either with the Kepler satellite or any of the other techniques we could use. But so far, Kepler-452, we only know of the one planet. Okay. Do we have a name for the star? Um, Kepler-452, period. The planet's Kepler-452, uh -huh. B. Okay. It's a very faint star. It's a thousand times fainter than you could see with your naked eye. Could it be seen from Mount Wilson? With the telescope, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. One of the issue, one of the questions is is are we alone in the universe? Mm -hmm. And I suppose that that comes up when there are conversations about 452b. Absolutely. The whole point, really, of looking for these other planets, these other Goldilocks planets, if you will. And the real point of the 2,500-year-old question is, are we alone? Not just are there other planets out there, is there other life out there? Mm -hmm. And we're on a scientific exploration to address that question. One of the first steps is to find the planets that are suitable for life. Mm -hmm. So 452b is one of the ones that could be suitable for life. It's a bit on the big side. It might or might not be a rocky planet like our own. It could be one of these icy worlds or close enough in to be a water world. Mm -hmm. But as we start finding these, what we're hoping is by the 40th anniversary of exoplanets, maybe another 20 years from now, we'll have found these Goldilocks planets around stars that are much closer to us, ones where we can use our telescopes to look for signs of life. Mm -hmm. And that's the next big quest for the next generation to embark on. Based on what you know now, any sign that there is or was life on no. 452b? 452b, we have no idea of knowing. We don't actually even know the mass of the planet. The Kepler technique lets you find the diameter of the planet, but it's too far away, the star is too faint to let us get its mass, which would tell us then, is it rocky or not? Mm -hmm. We need much more nearby stars with their planets to be able to follow them. Uh, and I know that as we look at the graphic there, one of the pieces that's significant is the, uh, the year, uh, 365 days for us, 385 days for 452B. Mm -hmm. That's significant for some now, reason? That's right in the middle of the habitable zone. Gotcha. So that just means you'd, uh, a year would be a little bit longer as far as uh, you know, the people on that planet might reckon a year, but that's a pretty much negligible difference. Mm. So when we talk about life, are we talking about vegetation or insects? The sort of life we can find most readily would be really microbial life, plant life, because that affects the atmosphere of the planet. So all the plants and the microbes, many of them produce the oxygen that we see in our atmosphere. Without life, there would be no oxygen in mm -hmm. our atmosphere. So we would use that as one of the signposts of life, and we could detect it in the atmosphere of a nearby planet. Um, our, our mutual friend, Ed Krupp, from, mm -hmm. uh, from the Griffith Observatory, when he was on this program a few years ago, we got to talking about the expectations and the definitions of life. Mm -hmm. um, is it possible that there's a, a totally different human, well, totally different kinds of life there that exists on something other than oxygen, nitrogen, maybe some, some atmosphere that we're not even aware of? Absolutely. There are certainly bacteria on Earth that thrive in environments that would kill a human in a second. We have life that thrives on methane instead of oxygen and CO2. We have life that can live in the pools outside of nuclear reactors in a very active 
radio, radioactive environment. We have life that thrives in the hot, very acidic pools up at Yellowstone. So life can find an amazing array of niches in which it can live. Mm -hmm. And it will adapt to its environment. Is the basic chemistry of life based on the common elements going to be different? Probably not. We, have, we know the elements of life, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, water. These are the abundant elements everywhere in the cosmos. They probably provide the playbook or the alphabet, yeah. but we have every th form of book that you can imagine is written with just 26 letters. Mm -hmm. You can imagine an awful lot of variety. Oh, sure. Before we take a break, there's one other quick question. If we were to, if we had a device to travel from here to there, um, how long would it take us to get there? Well, if we could go at the speed of light, which we can't, it would take uh, 1,400 years. If we went at a hundredth the speed of light, it would take you know 140,000 years. It's a long way. 452B would not be my destination. Mm -hmm. I would finish our little census of the nearby solar neighborhood, say out to 15 light years, maybe 30 light years. Within that region, there are going to be tens of Earth-like planets. And once that's done in the next 10 to 20 years, I would take my spaceship, which we don't yet have, and start looking. Uh, but if you put a human on there, that human would, would, it would take some more than one many, human many, life. Many, 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 many generations. Yeah. We're a long way away from being able to go there in any spaceship. Right. Well, Doctor, we're overdue for a break, so let's take care of that. Okay. Stay with us. We'll be right back. You should be more telling.